Hello Growl fans, it's me again, Vic Salinas. You may notice that I have a new camera. Uh, I do apologize, I've gotten some comments about that over the last, uh, I don't know, it's been six or eight months maybe. Uh, since my last camera died, um, kind of delayed getting a new one for a while. Uh, it was seeming to do okay with my webcam. Uh, it's supposed to be 1080p, but it never really came out looking like HD. I don't know, not really good with uh, cameras. However, I am proud to announce that I am using a new camera for this uh, video and the next few videos, so we'll see how that goes. I do apologize, I haven't uh, figured out all the settings yet. It takes a couple days to get used to. I just got this in the mail recently. Uh, so hopefully the video quality will improve. Uh, I'm not using the same microphone as I was along with the webcam, so the audio may be a little different. Uh, please bear with me over the next couple of videos. I will try to get that straightened out. But I'm pretty excited about having a new HD camera, and I hope you enjoy it. So for today's video, I'm going to be answering a subscriber question. Uh, this question comes from Reese, and I'll read it off my page here. Uh, Reese asks, I was wondering if there is any advice you could give me related to branching plot lines. For example, I begin with one plot line. A lord from the north is summoned to the capital by the king, and things spiral out from there. Treason, betrayals, false accusations, assassinations, declaration of war, etc. Sounds like my kind of story. I have seven main houses, each with several important characters, all of whom have plot lines and character arcs that cross and interweave at various points. I'm trying to keep magic to the background. Can you give me any advice to avoid the plot becoming a tangled, impenetrable mess? First, Reese, I want to thank you for submitting this question, and I will try my best to answer it uh, in as effective a manner as possible. Um, Telling a story from multiple points of view or uh, interweaving all the different points of view, as uh, Reese put it, is something that I enjoy doing. Uh, it's something that I enjoy reading. I like novels that do that. And uh, something that I like doing personally. Uh, those of you who have read The Sword and its Servant will know that it does uh, do that quite a bit. And for those of you that are not familiar with that, that is this book right here. That's the uh, first full-fledged novel that I had published, The Sword and Its Servant. And uh, in this book, and I'll use this as an example um, from my own personal writings as to how to do this, um, it starts off very simple, and that's the very first thing you have to do in order to assure that the reader doesn't get lost in the uh, ever-increasing complexity. I would say the best thing to do is start off with uh, one protagonist and one antagonist. So I know that Reese said he had seven different houses with uh, a number of different characters, which is fine. Um, I would pick just one character, uh, whoever is going to be your chief protagonist. A story should have a main character, uh, and just one main character that's on the protagonist side. And you can have any number of villains, really, but the reader needs to sympathize uh, chiefly with one protagonist. Uh, that's the standard formula. Uh, you can deviate from that, that's a whole other matter. Uh, not entirely advisable, but it is possible. Choose one protagonist and have the story stick with that one protagonist uh, at the very beginning and then you can alternate. Uh, so a formula that I like to use that's very simple is uh, at the very beginning of the story, whether that's your prologue or uh, preferably your chapter one, uh, that begins with this one main character, is this one protagonist point of view. And then so in this pattern, every odd number chapter tells the story from the uh, protagonist point of view, and then every even number chapter, so starting in number two, you tell one of the protagonist's side, and then you go uh, protagonist, antagonist, protagonist, antagonist, back and forth until you get to the entire novel. Another way you can do that is even within one chapter, show what uh, multiple sides are doing. So, you know, in chapter one, it shows uh, main character, and then villain number one, and then villain number two, and they're separated by line breaks. And then into the second chapter, again, it shows more or less that same pattern. Uh, something that I like to do is show the protagonist is more or less consistent throughout the entire thing. Again, using uh, the sword and its servant as an example. Uh, on the protagonist side, in the protagonist chapters or sections of chapters, you're always following the uh, lead protagonist, Ainsa. Uh, the story's always following her on the protagonist side. When it gets to the antagonists, you eventually have like four and it alternates. Uh, so, you know, one chapter is going to follow Ainsa, the main character. The next chapter after that is going to show villains one and three. Uh, then it's going to go to Ainsa, and then it's going to go to villains um, two and four. And it kind of more or less alternates in a pattern like that. So the reader comes to expect, okay, every now and then we're going to hear from these minor villains. 
uh, we'll always have at least one character that we're consistently getting information about, uh, the character that we're supposed to care about the most and should uh, know the most about, and then all the other characters, uh, to a lesser degree, are getting uh, different levels of exposure to, depending on how important they are. I would say that if you're going to uh, juggle this many plot lines, maybe six uh, would be the absolute maximum. Um, at one point in The Sword and its Servant, you have two protagonists that you get things from two different sides, and then, like I said, four different uh, antagonist sides, four different villains, and uh, they alternate more or less in a, in a pretty predictable geometric pattern so that they ne they're never forgotten about. You don't want the reader to get exposure to one character at the very beginning and then never hear about them again until the very end, uh, they need to be at least reminded in very small scenes throughout. You know, the, the way I like to look at it is like a movie. You know, the camera cuts to this menacing villain in the background every now and then and just shows you little pieces of what they're doing and how that influences the story so that we don't forget about them. Um, if you have seven houses and all of these houses have a number of main characters that need to interweave into your story, that's going to be really, really difficult. Um, you know, human beings can't really remember things beyond like six or seven different points. Uh, they always tell you uh, if you're designing a website not to put more than seven items uh, in the nav bar because people will tend to forget or not pay attention to things that are longer. If you see, you know, just imagine looking at a, a page. Okay, I'll show you my page of notes for this video real quick. Uh, kind of tearing down the fourth wall here. I only have, you know, a number of bullet points. If it's more than that, actually I have exactly seven bullet points here on my explanation. Uh, if it's more than that, if you look at a really complex page or you start to get overwhelmed by the scope of the story, uh, people get turned off really easily. So if you've thought out your world, uh, you're setting to a point where you have these seven houses and they all have their different histories and, and different persons and, and personalities that are within them, I would say save that for later installments. Uh, the very first book, if this is going to be a series, or if it's just going to be a standalone, should really focus on maybe just one or two or three of these houses that have a rivalry. Two would be really good, so you have a protagonist and antagonist one. Now, the other houses can have characters that show up. Um, they can have, you know, different entourages and dignitaries and um, diplomats and merchants and all sorts of military leaders and things that the uh, other characters, the main characters, interact with, and certainly you're going to hear news about what these other houses are doing in, in reaction to what the two or three main ones are going to be. But I think if you put in all seven houses, and each of them, say, had three or four characters, you're juggling too many uh, plot lines to have to weave into one story. It is possible. Uh, however, I think the reader is going to start to forget and care less and less about each individual one. And if they start to do that, they care less about the story. Uh, making a compelling story, you know, Lesson 101 is to make one main character that the reader focuses on, uh, one that they sympathize with, one that represents us, the reader, in the story. And if you start to cut out of that equation, like, the, the further you deviate from that, um, the harder it is to pull off, and the fewer and fewer people, I think, that will be uh, turned on by that story. So it's kind of a risky proposition. It is possible, uh, but my personal advice would be to avoid going beyond two or three different houses and uh, sticking to just one main character in each of those houses that's featured. And you can have any number of minor characters that pass on information or have confrontations with the main ones. And again, that's something that I did personally in The Sword and Its Servant. I'll just show you an example page in front of the camera, if you can see that. Uh, I did protagonist, antagonist, protagonist, antagonist. The protagonist is pretty much the same every odd chapter. And every even chapter is the antagonist, and they change. Uh, you know, you'll have different antagonists depending on how they're reacting to what the protagonist is doing. Uh, so, for example, we're looking at chapter 10 here. You see it will begin with the description of what this particular villain, Ulf, is doing. And then as you go through chapter 10, it shows what he's doing, describing his actions, his words, his thoughts. And then you get to a line break here. Okay, this is still in chapter 10. And then you have another character, uh, Ulf's brother Gestalt, and then it goes through his uh, piece in that chapter. And then you get to chapter 11, and then it goes right back to the main character, Einza. And so in that way, you can split it off, and you can do the same thing with a protagonist one, but if you keep that pattern of one, one series of chapters, either even or odd, is protagonist, and one series of chapters, either even or odd, is the antagonist, 
you can switch back and forth, and then within the chapters themselves, if you need to, depending on what's happening at that point, you can show multiple different characters. There are chapters in here that, uh, you know, if, if the whole story comes to a crossroads, that's, you know, some event takes place, and you have to describe the actions of just about everyone that's involved in the story, you know, you'll have two chapters right in the middle of the book, say, where, you know, the shit hits the fan, so to speak. And in the protagonist one, it may have several breaks, and each break will show what a different protagonist is doing. And then in the uh, antagonist chapter, it again will sh have breaks and then show what they're doing, and then split off from there. So your story is going to kind of like weave in and out all the time, and you can accomplish that by keeping an even pattern of even and odd, uh, back and forth, protagonist side, antagonist side. And then when necessary, within each chapter, show things with different line breaks, uh, alternate which characters appear, and make sure that they're, you know, each character is appearing at least every four or five chapters at the very least, so that we don't forget about them. I'll go ahead and wrap this video up by again thanking Reese for your question. I really enjoyed answering this. I hope I answered it uh, to the fullest extent uh, to answer your question. If not, you can always ask me any follow-up questions in the comments of this video. And any of you are certainly welcome to ask any questions you have about writing, creativity, me personally. Uh, leave your thoughts in the comments, and uh, like Reese's question, I can make that into a video. You can also always email me at victor.salinas at growalt.com. I'm very happy to get your emails. I get very many of them, and I try my best to respond to them as soon as possible. Don't forget to rate and share this video if you liked it, and subscribe to the Growalt channel. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.